Good morning, everybody. Just want to do a quick check, uh, make sure that you can hear me and see me. Okay. Yes, that's great. Excellent. Well, <clears throat> welcome everyone and thank you so much for joining us and happy World Social Work Day. And especially thank you to all the social workers out there. Uh, my name is Rebecca Levy and I have the privilege of serving as the acting US government special advisor for children in adversity. In this role, I lead the implementation of our US government advancing protection and care for children in adversity strategy or APCA which is our interagency commitment to investing in the development, care, dignity, and safety of the world's most vulnerable, vulnerable children and their families. Among other things, APCA recognizes the critical role of the social service workforce in supporting vulnerable families and ensuring protection and care for children. So thank you again for joining us this morning to celebrate and highlight the crucial role social service workers play in the protection of children, families, and other individuals in need and in particular to explore the optimal role and function of social service workers when located in schools and healthcare settings. USAID is very proud to be hosting this webinar alongside the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. For those of you who don't know, the Alliance is a network-based organization that works to ensure the social service workforce are well-planned, developed, and supported in communities across the globe. And they do this by serving as a convener for collective learning for a network of over 3,000 members across 148 countries by advancing knowledge and building the capacity of humanitarian and development actors through the development of evidence-based resources and tools and by advocating for workforce policy reforms. I'm so excited to be moderating this important webinar today because at APCA, we know that in order to achieve a world in which all children thrive within protective, loving families, free from deprivation, violence, and danger, we must have effective, well-resourced social service and child protection systems. And at the heart of those systems is a strong social service workforce. A, a professional trained social service workforce plays a critical role in supporting children and families and communities by supporting them to overcome poverty and social marginalization, by addressing and managing risks, by preventing and responding to violence, abuse, neglect, and family separation, and by assuring children and families receive essential social services. And the social service workforce doesn't just help people at the individual level. They're also key to promoting social justice, reducing discrimination, challenging and changing harmful behaviors and social norms. While social service workers are more traditionally known for their role in social welfare settings, they also play a crucial role in the protection and care of children and families when located in other community settings, such as schools, healthcare facilities, and courts, as well as within other contexts, such as emergency response and prevention. So for this webinar, we'll be focusing on the diverse role of social, the social service workforce in two specific settings, schools and healthcare settings. Children spend a significant amount of time each day in school, making it a place where child protection concerns can present themselves. And this gives school-based staff a vital frontline role in identification and response. Social service workers located in and working with schools when appropriately changed, tra uh, trained resources and supported can effectively address child protection concerns facing students, including violence, mental health, psychosocial well being, and holistic development. Integrating social workers within healthcare facilities provides the opportunity to address social determinants of health and ensure better access and adherence to treatment, thus, contributing to better treatment outcomes, to earlier and more sustained recovery, and wider improvements in social and emotional well being. Throughout the COVID 19 pandemic, in particular, we have witnessed the increasingly critical role of the social service workforce when placed in or closely linked to such settings, which are generally more local and accessible than social welfare offices. At USAID through APCA, we've taken a particular interest in looking at the role of the social service workforce in health facilities and schools, because the health and education sectors have the most wide reaching scale. And those are the most common environments where a child's needs can be identified and addressed. Because this is so critical to the implementation of APCA, we formed a social service workforce working group to think holistically about how the US government and USAID in particular can strengthen this workforce. In fact, one particular deliverable of this group has been to commission the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance to develop a paper on promising practice models for deployment of social service workers at health facilities in different parts of the world. 
The Alliance has also been working with UNICEF to develop a technical note on the optimal role of the social service workforce in or linked to schools. I'm so thrilled that we get to hear more from experienced panelists about both of these settings and how the social service workforce can contribute and collaborate with health and education sector actors. So thanks again for joining. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jamie Gao. Thank you so much, Rebecca. Before I begin, I just wanted to confirm that the slides are showing up as, as people would like to see them. Jessica, maybe you can confirm in the chat that that is the case. Uh, in the meantime, thanks again, Rebecca, for those remarks. My name is Jamie Gao, as Rebecca said, and I work with Rebecca as part of our USAID Children in Adversity team. I will be moderating today's webinar alongside Mari Mendenhall, who is with USAID's Office of HIV AIDS. And as Rebecca shared throughout this webinar, we will hear from a diverse group of global and country level speakers in order to both examine the diverse roles of social service workers located in schools and healthcare facilities, to exchange learning on how the social service workforce can most effectively work when located in such community settings. And lastly, to provide recommended strategies and interventions for strengthening the social service workforce in such settings. So we are grateful for having heard from Rebecca Levy, who is the acting U.S. Government Special Advisor on Children and Adversity from USAID. Thank you again, Rebecca. Uh, we are next going to be moving into a presentation from the Director of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance, Hugh Salmon, who will be releasing and discussing the findings and recommendations from a new technical note, which has been developed in consultation with UNICEF on the optimal role of the social service workforce in schools. And then Paul Marsden, who is a social, uh, health so, uh, workforce specialist from WHO, will then provide an overview of the role of the social service workforce when located in health settings, as well as the need to integrate health and social service sectors. After Hugh and Paul's presentation, we will open it up to a panel discussion with a range of country level speakers who will provide practical examples of the optimal role and function of the social service workforce in both schools and healthcare settings. So speaking of the role of social workers in schools, we're very fortunate to be joined by Amara, who is a child protection specialist from UNICEF Mongolia. We also have Tina, a social service officer from UNICEF Georgia. And Young is a, a school social worker who leads a small private organization called Educational Society in Korea, as well as the former president for the Korean Association of School Social Workers. From there, we will move into the role of social workers in healthcare facilities. And for that, we have another great panel. We're joined by Enda Shah, who is an Orphans and Vulnerable Children Technical Director of the Mekdem Ethiopia National Association. We also have Coyote, who is the Deputy Director of Medical Social Services Department at the University College Hospital in Nigeria, as well as the President for the Association of Medical School Workers in Nigeria. And lastly, we will hear from Richard, who is a deputy chief of party for the USAID funded Pathways Orphans and Vulnerable Children Project with Catholic Relief Services in Zimbabwe. So we're really fortunate to be able to hear from, from these global voices today. A few very quick webinar housekeeping items before we jump in. If you have a question for any of our speakers or panelists, please feel free to submit those at any time via the Q&A feature. If your question is for a specific speaker or panelist, please do note that. Our speakers and panelists will work to respond to your questions via the Q&A feature, and we'll also be responding to questions from the audience later in the webinar. If you're having any technical difficulties during the webinar, please do submit a message via the chat feature to the hosts. And lastly, the webinar is being recorded and will later be available via the Alliance's website. So now I am going to turn it over to our very first speaker, Hugh Salmon. Hugh is the director of the Global Social Service Workforce Alliance. He is a qualified social worker with 10 years of experience in direct social work practice. Excuse me. And uh, he also has 20 years of experience internationally as a technical advisor, trainer, consultant, and program manager. Hugh, over to you. Thank you very much indeed, Jamie, and I hope everybody can see my first slide. Um, so I'm assuming that's all okay. Um, so just to say, yeah, I'm the director of the Alliance and based in Kyrgyzstan in Central Asia. It's a, it's a great thrill to be with you all on World Social Work Day. Um, I'm going to be just briefly sharing some findings from this report. 
uh, which has been put together by some colleagues, particularly thanks to, to Stephen and Emily who work with us to, to develop this, but with a whole range of key informants and participants. Um, and we gathered information from literature worldwide as well. It's really a, a summary of what we know so far about the role of social service workers in schools and some key recommendations for governments and other decision makers. Um, but we also have um, a chance to hear more from you because we believe that we can learn a lot more about this. And in fact, during the whole of this year, we're gonna be making this a big theme of ours, trying to strengthen understanding and, and resources for social service workers in specific settings Firstly, schools, also healthcare facilities, and we'll be looking later at um, emergency response and recovery because that's a big theme going on with the conflict that we, we're aware of in, in Ukraine, but in a number of other situations in the pandemic, the response of the social service workforce to crises and emergencies has been particularly important. But today we're focusing on schools and health settings. So I'll just run, run through some of the key findings. And then we very much look forward to hearing from you with additional insights and experience from anybody who, who is a social worker in a school or another form of social service worker, um, we'd love to hear from you later in the discussion. Um, so this is the technical note, which is being released today. You can find it on our website if you go to the resources section. Um, just very briefly, you'll be familiar with a slide if you've attended any of our previous presentations. This is just to explain our concept of the social service workforce, which is an inclusive concept which includes professional social workers at the heart, um, but also includes a range of other job titles that you can see on the, on the right-hand side there. Um, and we recognize that it's therefore a horizontally diverse workforce. It's also vertically differentiated in the sense that we work at many different levels. Um, we work in a prevention way, we, we are responsive when needs arise, and we also promote wider issues and we advocate for the work that we're doing. And people do that in governmental, non-governmental roles, uh, as, as qualified professionals or paraprofessionals with a short amount of training as well. So it's a very diverse workforce. We're looking at that, the different forms of social service workers in schools. So the first major finding is that, that they, schools do indeed um, provide a critical space to address violence against children, because of course, this is the place where those challenges are often first identified. Children spend a lot of time there. And so, you know, school-based child protection concerns can be addressed there and they do not occur in isolation. Uh, so we can use a whole school approach to recognize the role of, of protection in the school and within their wider environment. It's particularly important for the most marginalized students because schools is a very important place for them to access crucial services that they might otherwise struggle to access in their own communities. So schools are critical spaces to address violence against children. Sorry, I'm just trying to advance my slide. Uh, states are also obligated to protect children from, from all forms of violence, including in school settings. So it's really just to say that um, the obligation to protect children from violence includes the school setting as well, very much so. Um, so schools, uh, states have that responsibility, schools have that responsibility, and that's very much enshrined in international norms and standards. Um, and also we need to look at the fact that preventing and addressing child protection in schools also helps achieve educational outcomes. So if teachers are worried that, um, you know, this is a distraction from their core work, it absolutely isn't because by helping children be, be healthy and safe and protected, we're also making sure that they can achieve their learning goals as well and their overall, um, overall well-being and development as an individual. And children are better protected in schools when those schools are connected with a wider child protection system. So ministries of education should really budget and plan for child protection and child participation in their education strategies. And when they use a collaborative team-based approach and they bring together teachers, school administrators, social service workers and community members, then they can really achieve safe and positive learning environments and an effective coordination of specific services and interventions. But those staff need to be trained and supported. Um, because in many countries, teachers and school administrators, they just lack the time, they often, they haven't been trained to support and work with those who have been abused or um, victims of violence, and they feel they don't have the mandate, they don't have the sort of entitlement or, the, or they don't have the role to do so. So we need to acknowledge that they have a role to play. 
So they can particularly record concerns as they're aware of them when a child mentions that they've been abused or they're feeling at risk. And they can then make referrals and work with external agencies. And then working alongside the school staff, the social service workforce can address child protection issues as they arise and connect um, interventions at the school with a wider child protection system. And those education authorities also need to recruit, train and support teachers to ensure successful child protection responses. So I think you could hear, I'm talking here about social workers and teachers, social service workforce and wider school staff coming together and they both need to be equipped to do this work in a school setting. And very much important that the social service workforce should be integrated in schools and education systems. So they're not something just to put to one side or to have as a bolt on solution. Having social service workers in schools should be part of education system and planning and budgeting. And so we need to also have realistic job descriptions, working conditions and capacity building of those, of those staff who need to be also supported and supervised. And that will ensure effective social service work practice in schools. Those schools in turn need to be integrated. So, so we need to make sure that, that the, um, the focus of the, the, the workforce in school will be, they'll be properly trained, but exactly what they do will depend a little bit on the school size and on the type of child protection concerns and the age of students. So it's not necessarily one size fits all, the model will need to vary. And, and of course, how effectively social service workers can work in schools very much depends on the wider child protection services. So if there are no services around the school and there's nobody or no services to refer to, then it's much more challenging. So we need to look at the wider system in which the school fits. So the social service workforce, they can be physically located in schools. Uh, so they work every day in the school itself, or they might be linked to a school. So they might visit a school on a regular basis or a cluster of schools. So depending on which model they, on which context they're in, that might determine which model is most suitable. So just to, just to remind ourselves that the social service workforce works at the promotive, preventive, uh, preventive and responsive level. And that's very much also the case in schools. So we need to have this full continuum of services to create an environment of, of preventive support, uh, but also to be able to provide specialized response. And to have that effective child protection in schools, we really need to have multi-stakeholder engagement. So we need to really work with, uh, uh, you know, st st social workers are trained to take a ecological perspective. I'm sure you all know that as, as social workers attending today, but that's very important in schools to have that holistic approach and to see the student in the context of not only their school, but their family and, and the community. And it's important for those social service workers also to engage with families and communities. And it's also important that schools do that as well. So we're not just working with students in the school, but we're trying to work with their families and the community and the schools should see that as their job as well. And just finally, it's very important to advocate for effective development and professionalization of the social service workforce in schools. So the reason why we have a question that we're gonna to come to a bit later in terms of whether these initiatives are short-term or whether they are sustained, is because often we see that there are small initiatives, maybe to train one small group of social workers to go to one small group of schools, and maybe they stay there for a year or a couple of years, but often there isn't sustained training and resourcing, and often the, the role that they play is not fully understood and recognized. So we need to have sustained capacity building of both the social service workers in schools and the teachers and school administrators to achieve a, a really sustainable and integrated approach for referral coordination, monitoring and response. Okay, so again, just a reminder that the, the paper is out and can be found on, on our website. Okay, thank you very much. Back to you. Thank you, Hugh, that was super. Uh, there were many points that resonated, but I think in particular, the point about schools being such a critical place in which to address violence against children how essential budgeting is for, for this work and the many points you made about a holistic approach, both in terms of children's needs, but as well as a team-based approach to ensure that needs are in fact addressed and the integration of services both inside and outside of school walls. Those were points that really resonated. So thank you for that great presentation and very excited to have the, the note out. I will now be introducing Paul Marsden. He is a health workforce specialist with the World Health Organization based in Geneva. Over the past 25 years, 
He has directly supported and advised various governments and development partners on a wide range of programs and initiatives, including long-term technical advisory postings across many countries, including South Africa, Namibia, Malawi, Uganda, Nigeria, Lesotho, and here in the US. So with that, I will turn it over to you, Paul. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let me just uh, upload the presentation. Hopefully you can now see that. Yep, thank you. Great. Okay. Okay, well, thanks everybody. Uh, good day and good evening. Uh, it's a huge pleasure to be part of this discussion today. Uh, I did have the privilege of uh, being in a similar event last year with the USAID's Workforce 2030 partnership. Uh, and I'd like to uh, uh, put out a presentation uh, today, which looks at considering some of the key global uh, workforce perspectives for delivering social services within the healthcare facilities and uh, settings. Uh, I'd, I'd, I'd like to highlight some of the current context and, and agenda and include one or two initiatives in this area which the World Health Organization are taking forward. And then I'd like to briefly revisit the integration of health and care services and take a look at how this is evolving um, in health facilities and care settings and provide one or two examples of country-led initiatives which we, we, we're aware of. I'll then highlight some of the main benefits of integrated social care within the facilities and then set out some of the workforce implications for consideration and end with a call to action in terms of what we can do. Hey Paul. Paul, could you yeah. could you click on slideshow and then present? Sorry, ah, I'm sure you can sorry, sorry. It's through, I think it may have okay, you have it now. Great. You have the slideshow now, yeah? Yep, perfect, thank you. Excellent, sorry, my apologies. Computer screen froze. <laughs> anyway, um, so some background, uh, looking at estimates of the broader health and care economy um, would suggest we have somewhere around 234 million people working in the health and social care economy. And this is a real mix of formal, informal, and voluntary employment we see here. And we expect this will grow to around 350 million by 2030, which is more than two thirds uh, of this workforce being women. Uh, what the WHO defines this workforce um, in, in terms of those that cover uh, all of the, uh, the health well-being and health-related social care uh, functions. And this definition covers all of those who are providing facility-based residential, long-term care services, including health assistants and social work practitioners. Um, significant disruptions to essential services have been persistent feature over the course of the pandemic, and with several countries highlighting some shortfalls in availability as a principal cause of these. Uh, the protection of existing funding and investment in the workforce is therefore a critical priority. So, the workforce agenda, the future of the health and care workforce, requires us to have a reset in our approach to its planning, management, and resourcing, and which now takes place, uh, or which now places more emphasis on enabling governance and leadership functions, capacity, and workforce competency, both across and between sectors to deliver those essential services. So effective planning for the health and care workforce really requires more integration, collaboration, and coordination between sectors and stakeholders using data-driven policy and investment uh, to drive investment decisions that are both adaptive and uh, flexible in response to need, and that consider the overall health, social, and economic scope and impact. As a platform uh, for driving uh, workforce investment and action, the WHO are currently developing a Working, uh, a working for Health eight-year action plan, and this will be presented at this year's World Health Assembly in May, and this will help enable countries to create, uh, resource, and implement their national health and care workforce investment plans. And this will be informed by detailed uh, data, evidence, and labor market analysis. And this will help optimize uh, the use of existing and future health and care workers by creating and distributing the jobs and skills needed. It will also look at building the diversity, availability, and capacity of the health and care workforce and address those critical shortages 
and will also strengthen the economic health and social impact of workforce investments and enhance health system preparedness, resilience and performance and really strengthen the workforce across the board and its ability to deliver UHC and respond to public health emergencies, etc. So uh, last year I highlighted what an integrated people-centered health and social service workforce might, uh, model might look like. And I put this back here today because the intersection of the health and social service programs within health facilities and settings, this really ensures that quality services, including social work, are made available to meet the needs of clients through strong referral and collaborative uh, linkages that connect the broader health system at primary care level and that also connects with community and home-based services, really placing facility-based people-centered care and support close to the population. Uh, integrated facility-based services are therefore delivered uh, through multidisciplinary primary health care teams, and these require effective coordination, uh, collaboration, which is underpinned by strong referral and support systems. And within these multidisciplinary teams, there is a need to clearly define and optimize social work-related job roles, uh, core competencies, and support in line with the availability and delivery of essential prevention, promotion, and uh, care service functions, which are defined and prioritized based on the prevailing need and context. Uh, the, the evolving role uh, and scope of integrated social care and health and uh, facilities and settings, the pandemic has had a major impact on health and social care services with widespread disruptions to essential services being a feature uh, of longstanding workforce limitations. Uh, meanwhile, demogra dem demographic change is driving a shift from mainly clinical care towards the delivery of health promotion uh, and prevention and management uh, and, and care and facilities and health settings, including treatment, uh, care and management of multi-morbidities and non-communicable diseases through multidisciplinary health and care teams, uh, which place social work intervention at the forefront of what we do. Uh, this evolving role and scope of social care within facilities and settings now encompasses core packages of essential health and social services, such as outpatient uh, care, risk assessment, uh, the development of post-care plans, and a range of other non-clinical interventions and continuity of care, including the provision of mental health and well-being services, counselling and support, as well as ageing care and strengthened uh, referral and linkages across child protection, adult social care, and long-term care. So some country examples of integrated health and social care systems, we're also seeing more increased alignment and integration of health and social care services with examples from Scotland, which is my uh, home country. Uh, and we've just recently released uh, its first joint national integrated health and social care workforce uh, strategy, uh, which calls for the establishment of a national care service and a new national social work agency with the aim of delivering more flexible and agile services. In India, we're seeing the deployment of a significant number of social workers in hospitals who provide child protection and mental health, among other services. Denmark has linked to social workers with its aging care programs and long-term care, long care facilities and community programs. The US uh, deploying medical social work programs uh, and linking these to health and primary care teams. And last but not least, in Zambia and other countries where the integration of this community-based uh, workers provide health and social care really at the interface of the facility and the community. And we see this in many uh, similar countries and environments. So what are the benefits of integrated care? There are multiple benefits from integrated health facility-based care and social work services. And these really include establishing appropriate models of care that can ensure accessible services, including outpatient care, support, case management, risk assessment, and, and referral directly at the point of delivery and delivering effective bundles of those health and social care programs and services and functions through a combined biomedical, uh, behavioral and ecological approach, ensuring that there's sustainable, competent and trained core of social workers and paraprofessionals embedded within these multidisciplinary primary care teams and facilities. So to support these approaches, the World Health Organization are continually de uh, developing and sharing evidence-based guidance and collaboration with key partners and really looking at how to provide integrated care, especially in emergency and low-resourced 
settings. Uh, we provide technical assistance and support to countries to develop evidence-based policy that really responds to national priorities uh, and context, and also the promotion of tools and approaches to improve health and social care worker knowledge and core competencies. All of these actions really support country-specific efforts to deliver UHC and develop integrated health and social care delivery systems. So workforce implications, the, impl uh, the implications of uh, this uh, integration for the workforce are wide ranging. There's a need uh, for additional clinical and social work providers deployed with the relevant skills and qualifications and, and in the right locations to provide the full package of services. Uh, a precondition in low and middle income countries is to really look at increasing the general supply, the deployment and the utilization of health and social work providers. And we need greater coordination to support patient-focused care and people-centered integrated services. And this will include social workers and paraprofessionals functioning as care coordinators, case managers, et cetera, uh, including in chronic disease management and in primary care to fill the gaps uh, and to attend to non-clinical needs. And also to ensure that we have the right competencies and scopes of practice for health and social work practitioners. So onto the final slide. So what can we do? So what can we do? So uh, one of the four, uh, a couple of the suggestions here to really look at how we can in, and engage all stakeholders and partners, and, and really looking at joint policy and social dialogue on issues of integrated health and social uh, work, uh, integrated health and social work related services standards and delivery within facilities and settings really looking at recognizing, supporting, and accommodating expanded roles uh, and scopes of practice and core competencies for social work practitioners and health settings in response to changing population needs, uh, enhancing and protecting the rights and access to per uh, person-centered health and social care services for all, and also ensuring that those who are involved in the provision of integrated health and social care services they're adequately protected and supported and they're on secure pay, uh, working conditions and within a supportive governance, legal and regulatory environment. So with that, I hand back and many thanks to all and back over to uh, the, the, the facilitator. I'm looking forward to the, uh, the discussions later in the session. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank Super, you. thank you so much, Paul. Um, it was really illuminating to hear about the action plan for the next decade or so, as well as some of the key elements you touched on, including standards of delivery, core competencies, the ability to respond to changing population needs. So thank you for that. Really appreciated the integrated health and social service uh, pitch and those great country examples. And also the last or one of the main points about how the COVID-19 pandemic has made even more clear how critical social care and social work intervention can be. So thank you for that great presentation. Thank you all very much for bearing with our, our technical difficulties. Um, I think we're done with the, the presentations at this point. Please, just a reminder, if you do have a question, it's great to see such an active chat and we would love to receive those questions in the Q&A section of, of Zoom. So you can find that um, at the, for me, it's in the bottom under those three little dots, but depending on your views, you should just see a little Q&A button and be able to submit in that way. So thank you again to those great panelists. I'm now very thrilled to turn it over to Mari Mendenhall, who is going to help to facilitate a panel discussion. Um, in addition to what I just said about utilizing the Q&A for your questions, um, if you do have a question that you're targeting to a particular panelist, please just go ahead and note that when you do submit. With that, over to you, Mari. Thank you. You need to unmute, Mari. Sorry about that. I just wanted to say that those were fantastic presentations. I, I really appreciate um, hearing so much about your ideas and I am really eager to learn more from our presenters. And uh, we do have such a wonderful um, team of panelists today. So um, I wanted to see if perhaps we could hear a little more about each of these panelists and give them an opportunity to introduce themselves and to talk a little bit about the work that they're doing in 
um, each of the specific countries that they're supporting. And I wonder if we could start with maybe our team that's focused on uh, schools. So Amara, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, just kind of a brief discussion about um, some, some of the work that you're doing to support social service workers in schools? Uh, hi, everyone, and uh, very happy uh, World Social Work Day. I am a social worker by my background, so it's great to see that this day is celebrated everywhere. And uh, I've seen uh, like uh, uh, hundreds of posts today on, on social media in the, in the country. So it's, it's been celebrated uh, uh, with pride, I, I would say, in the country. Um, yes, my name is Amara and uh, I am a child protection specialist in UNICEF uh, Mongolia country office. And I've been uh, working in area of child protection for about 20 years now. And uh, by my background, I have a degree in law and then also my master's in social work. So I, I always think that this is a great combination for doing the child protection work. So this is uh, very brief uh, about me. And of course, uh, as a child protection, we uh, do lots of child protection system strengthening uh, in the country that includes social service workforce strengthening as the main strategy. And uh, we do also online protection, justice for children. So we, we cover quite uh, uh, many different areas of work. Well, thank you so much. I look forward to hearing more. Um, now let's hear from, uh, from Tina. Could you tell us a little more about yourself, Tina? Hello, everyone. Thank you for this invitation and the chance to be here. Very happy to be here, actually. Uh, my name is Tina. I'm from UNICEF, Georgia. I'm a social worker as well by profession and education. But in this role of social services officer at UNICEF, Georgia, I mostly work at uh, uh, supporting the strengthening of social work in the school settings uh, and in other systems as well. For example, the justice system at the central and the local level. Um, I have uh, two master's degrees in social work. I'm engaged in academia as well and I have uh, I have frontline experience as well as a social worker so professionally and personally I'm very committed to, to developing this profession and very happy to be here again thank you very much oh this is so exciting wonderful well Kion let's hear from you could you tell us a little more about yourself as well okay uh, first uh, thank you for the uh, presentation uh, my career as a school social worker started with a pilot project in Korea during the initial stage in 1999. After that, I freelanced for various entities such as school social workers, social workers at the Department of Education in local government and teachers. I was also served as the third chairperson of the Korean Association of School Social Workers. Well, this is wonderful. I knew a little bit about all of you, but um, my goodness, you are very, very experienced. Now let's hear a little bit about our, um, our presenters that are going to focus on social service workers and health facilities. So let's have Inda Shaw. Could you begin? Could you tell us a little bit about the work that you're doing and yourself? Okay, thank you, Maria. Thank you all. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, all of you. Thank you very much for organizing this webinar session and inviting us uh, Ethiopians uh, uh, to share our experiences. So I wish happy social work day. So my name is Ndisha Yamana. I'm currently working at Macadam Ethiopia National Association uh, as Office Service Director for USID funded family focused HIV prevention care and treatment activity. The aim of the project is to strengthen the local epidemic control to achieve the 395 UNS goals. So MENA or Macadamia Ethiopia is a national association that's a local organization. So, and I also served as senior technical advisor for multi-sectoral district transformation at the government of Ethiopia and the Ministry of Women, Children and Youth. And I also served as chief of party or project manager for the USID funded uh, social service system strengthening, particularly focusing on 
the social service workforce planning, development, and strengthening. And prior to that, I also have uh, experience of working in OVC related activities. Overall, I have uh, over 15 years of work experience uh, related with the OVC and the social service system. And educationally, I have MA degree in social psychology and also VA degree in sociology and VA degree in geography and environmental science. So I'm a husband and also have three children. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's a lot of degrees yes. and wonderful children. Um, uh, so let's hear a little bit from um, Coyote. Could you tell us a little bit about yourself as well in Nigeria? Thank you. Um, I want to wish everyone happy Social Work Day. And I'm very grateful to be part of this panel because I've been hearing the wonderful presentations since uh, we start, when we start this, uh, this program. I am Obidengwe Kayode by name. I'm the Deputy Director at the University College Hospital Department of Medical Social Services. I've been working as a medical social worker for the past 27 years, almost 29 years now. And I have specialization in psychology and then master's degree in social work. I'm a student of PhD, research student in social work at the University of Nigeria, Nsuka. I've been working as a social worker. I currently head the, uh, the children department of medical social services unit and head of the child protection unit at the University College Hospital. Currently, I'm the president of the Association of Medical Social Workers of Nigeria. I used to be the general secretary. Sometimes after from finishing my office as a general secretary, I'm translated and voted in as the president of the association as a current president. And I've been working with children, looking at the psychosocial issues in their life, of the children and the patient and their parents, as well as uh, providing all social support for over so many years. And I have uh, so many teams of people that are also working you know, within that department that are making you know, impact in the life of children and their parents who are facing challenges of health and the combination of poverty and so many other issues that affect their health. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, so let's see. So now our last panelist is uh, Richard from Zimbabwe. Richard, could you tell us a little more about yourself and some of the work that you're doing in Zimbabwe? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, people, Social Workers Day, everyone. So my name is Richard Savo. I am um, a social worker by training and I've been pra a practicing social worker for over a decade now and I've been working in various um, social work settings, both primary and secondary social work settings. Um, currently, I'm the deputy chief of party for the Pathways Project, which is an OVC project or Orphans and Vulnerable Children project funded by PEPFA through USAID in Zimbabwe. And this is a five-year project uh, whose goal is to contribute to HIV epidemic control and maybe what I can say briefly about that one is uh, to the project uh, social service workers who drive the robust case management approach uh, that we use to attain epidemic control. And uh, the project is deploying multiple wraparound approaches which are rooted within the four broader perspectives or OVC domains, uh, making sure that our OVC are healthy, they are safe, they are coming from economically stable households, and they are schooled so that we can achieve the required graduation benchmarks. So we have got uh, a very close relationship and interaction with both schools and health facilities. I think for now, uh, that's what I can say, and I'm happy about the presentation that we have made and how they are also reflecting the work that we are currently doing in terms of our contribution to improve the health outcomes for the communities that we serve. Thank you. 
Wow. Well, thank you. This is a fantastic team. I'm a social worker as well. And um, I feel like it's our birthday. It's kind of like a party. So um, I am very, very, very excited to hear more about you all today. I know we all are. And so I want to just remind everyone that if you have any questions as we are going through some of the discussions that we've already um, kind of put together, we will uh, be sure to leave some time for some of these questions that you're putting in the um, in the chat box. And so uh, don't worry, I'm sure your questions are excellent and we'll make sure to make time for those. But I have a few questions that I'd love to start with. And my first questions are for Amara and Tina. I wanted to see, uh, could, could you both tell us some of the key roles of social service workers in schools that you see in your countries? Do I start? Yes, go ahead. You can go first. Okay. Yeah, uh, in uh, Mongolia, it's been uh, 26 years, actually, social work uh, um, has been introduced as an academic discipline. It's, it's been only 26 years, but uh, we've done a lot um, to use the profession for, for protecting children in the country. Now we have over 10, in, 11 universities offering um, different degrees of academic level programs. And uh, uh, we have uh, social workers in all of the schools. Uh, on in, in the last uh, over two decades only, all the, the school social work has been introduced throughout the country, not only in urban areas, but or also in rural areas where it's very important because we have many uh, children uh, from herd of families who come to stay in boarding schools uh, without, you know, their pa parental supervision. So they actually come under the supervision of the schools and school social workers. Um, and uh, um, um, as of 2021, uh, the government in total employed 3,188 social workers, out of which um, uh, 872 are school social workers working in 848 schools. And very good news is that 85% uh, of the school social workers are trained qualified social workers, which is not the case as we compare to social workers, you know, status in, in other, um, other sectors. And the Ministry of Education uh, approved the job description, uh, code of ethics, um, and, uh, and uh, training materials for, for social workers uh, throughout these years. And uh, the job description actually outlines uh, four main uh, roles that include um, uh, support for providing uh, a child-friendly environment, ensuring protection for children, promoting participation of the child in school life and networking with parents and teachers. This is very, uh, you know, wide in scope, uh, but uh, in, in the practice, social workers really take on uh, a range of duties. Uh, they, they, they do uh, lead the development of child protection related policies, including the safeguarding policies, procedures in schools. They do lots of awareness and education programs, um, uh, you know, to prevent from risks and threats of violence, not only among the, the children, students, but also among the parents. And they also do lots of training for the school class uh, tutors, the teachers, and they do provide uh, parenting education to parents. And then, uh, of course, their main duties would really include uh, detection, assessment, referral, and counseling. So it, they, they, they have a big hat, uh, really, to, um, yeah. And uh, they, uh, of course, uh, would be difficult for them to do all these tasks uh, on their own. So they also serve as a team member of the community level multidisciplinary teams where they, they can really coordinate the work with, uh, with other uh, social service workforce outside of the school settings. So it, it's important. And uh, of course, they do closely work with the teachers, psychologists, and school nurse. Actually, this is a good team uh, to, you know, to, to work with children in school settings. Yeah, and uh, 
so uh, the, the main role is really to identify the children and then the, the families behind the children, you know, and who need support. So they assess the situation, make resource, uh, make uh, referrals to resources that are available to the students and uh, families outside of the school. So this is uh, very briefly what they do and who they work with. And um, I actually, I also wanted to say that the government of Mongolia has been making great efforts to really professionalize the social service workforce and strengthen the, the system. Uh, one example is revision and approval of the code of uh, ethics again in 2021, uh, 2020. Um, and then also standards for provision of social work services that includes requirement for licensing and supervision has just been approved by the Minister of uh, Labor and Social Protection. So these are uh, very applicable to, uh, to uh, you know, strengthening the workforce in schools and, you know, it's, it's really, um, you know, helpful legal uh, documents uh, for, for application. So that's that's it. <laughs> that's a lot. <laughs> Thank you. Wonderful. Well, um, Tina, could you talk to us a little bit about uh, your experience as well? Thank you very much, Mari, and thank you, Amara, for, for your uh, information and insights. Well, before I go to the specific roles and functions of social workers in school settings, I would like to very briefly draw your attention on the policy and regulatory framework within which social work operates in Georgia, uh, because I think that for the audience as well, it might be important to know the context that definitely influences the way social work is understood and practiced and conceptualized in, in, in the field of education and in the Georgian reality more specifically. So uh, we have two major uh, documents in relation to the children's rights and social work that regulate um, to some extent the social work profession in the field of education and in other fields as well. The first one is the Code on the Rights of the Child, which is an umbrella document, a special law that unites all guiding principles um, uh, in, in relation to the child protection and the child's well-being. So it actually guides all state ministries, state agencies, online ministries, uh, um, administrative bodies, uh, public and private organizations, uh, when it comes uh, to dealing with children and making decisions about children. So that code actually places a special emphasis on social work profession in the educational settings as well, among other, other fields, and really amplifies its importance. So that's the first uh, like major policy regulatory framework. And the other one that directly regulates the social work in the school settings as well is the law on social work that was adopted in 2018. And actually what it did um, uh, uh, was that it introduced social work profession in many settings um, uh, and uh, really created the opportunities uh, to improve the quality of social work across the fields and across the country. So in that way, those two policy changes really influenced the way, and those changes are quite recent if you look at it, really influenced the way how social work is introduced in many settings. And it really it contributed to the increased demand uh, to the social social workers in the school settings. Whether the demand is met, it's another issue, and I can talk about the challenges later on within this discussion, but it definitely contributed to the increased demand. It definitely diversified the settings and the spaces where social workers are introduced. It really introduced the new players in the child protection section, the child protection field, and in that sense, created more guarantees for child protection and for children's rights. So in line with that policy changes and regulatory changes that has been supported by UNICEF Georgia very strongly, we specifically supported the Ministry of Education and Science to develop a model for social work development in the school settings. That is yet another uh, framework to conceptualize the roles and the functions of social workers in the school settings. And that model was actually, has been actually approved by the Ministry of Education and Science and the social workers are already recruited and in the school settings working with children and families. I will try very briefly to, um, to uh, inform you how, what are the major functions of social workers on micro, meso, and macro level. Uh, there are obviously the roles and functions that uh, um, are applicable to all those levels and are cross-cutting. But on a micro level in the in the school setting, social workers um, mostly work to identify the vulnerable children or, or groups of children uh, and um, plan um, uh, plan relevant um, actions and responses. They work. Uh, they their tasks 
to uh, conduct biopsycho biopsychosocial assessment of children. They are also tasked to use case management as a social work method. They are engaged in advocacy for children's needs and challenges in the school setting. They work, uh, they provide psychosocial uh, counseling and services for children, parents, families, and the teachers as well. And um, they are engaged in, in multi-sectoral cooperation as well. On the, on the meso level though, social workers are tasked to, um, to contribute to the overall improvement of the school climate uh, through strengthening the relationships between the child and the school, between the family and the school, and between the community and the school. And on a macro level, uh, social workers in schools are tasked to um, identify best practices and also dysfunctional practices that can inform the policy dialogue in the field of education. Uh, and as I said, there are cross-cutting roles and functions that uh, vary through all those levels. They are obliged to work in compliance with the ethic, uh, social work ethics code that, that has been also approved, similar to, to what Amara just said. Um, they are also obliged to um, maintain the documentation, um, uh, ensure the professional growth and development, and um, professional supervision as well. So this is very briefly about this roles and the functions. Uh, I'm very aware of the time constraints. So if you have uh, further questions, I'll be happy to answer during the Q&A session. So over to you, Mary. I'm sure there will be more questions, but that is excellent. I really, really appreciate all of the um, all of the, the very unique and different work that you all are doing. I'm going to ask uh, Inda Shah and Richard to answer a similar question. Could you both tell us some of the key roles for social service workers who are, um, are working in health facilities and in your countries? Okay, can I start, <laughs> Inda Shah? Please, go ahead, yeah. Inda Shah. Well. Uh, thank you very much again. Uh, I'll just uh, give uh, some my experiences or share my experiences related with the role of social service workers in the health setting. Uh, actually, in Ethiopia and particularly in, for PEPAFAR funded programs, social service workers support health facilities with HIV testing activities by identifying new HIV cases and ensuring that those who are HIV positive access the services they need so they can adhere and achieve viral or suppression. They work in close collaboration with uh, HIV service providers in the health facilities like PMCT, ART, VCT, and uh, case managers. Social service workers have a good experiences to bridge the gap between the silos of social services and healthcare through intervention like case management, family engagement, assessment, care planning, behavioral health intervention, and also social service provision. So specifically, uh, the activities they do in the health settings are one, related with the HIV testing, they raise awareness about the available services or HIV testing among program beneficiaries administer HIV risk assessment tools with all children less than 18 whose HIV status is not known, identify and address barriers beneficiaries have to HIV testing, increase awareness and access to early infant diagnosis or AID among HIV exposed infants, identify children of index cases with unknown HIV status through patient chart reviews in the health facilities and offer referral to index case testing programs. And likewise, they also have uh, undeserved uh, support for linkage to ART. So they link HIV positive children to ART services, provide support for disclosure of HIV status, counsel and educate beneficiaries on linkage, retention and adherence, conduct routine home visit and follow up on clients facing an interruption of two treatment. And similarly, they also adhere the, uh, follow the adherence and uh, viral or suppression. So they increase the beneficiaries ART literacy, make sure that children have a stable and reasonable adult caregivers who oversee them in taking their ART medication, increase awareness among caregivers about the importance of them that is taking their child to the health facility for their appropriate 
uh, appointments so they can hear directly from the doctors or the health service providers about how the child should take the medication, educate children about the importance of taking their ART medication exactly as the doctor uh, or indicated or prescribed, help the child and the caregivers find methods that remind the child to take the medication. If the child needs to take his or her medication during the schoolhouse, discuss with the child and also the teachers and their counselors at private place in the school where the child could take his or her medication during the schoolhouse. And this should be uh, done only with the caregiver's uh, permission. Support caregivers in closing the child's HIV status. Identify and tackle, uh, track lost follow-up children and re-engage them to ART services. Assess barriers to retention in care, adherence in treatment like individual healthcare providers or structural. Educate and remind for beneficiaries for viral load monitoring and encourage caregivers to engage in household economic strengthening services, especially to share their experiences and also uh, to share their uh, burden or the challenges with their uh, peers. In addition to this, they also uh, support and lead the gender-based violence, violence dialogue sessions that will be conducted in the school and out of school. They screen and refer GBB services and also facilitated facilitates the different uh, services for uh, GBB survivors, record and report GBB cases identified and linked to appropriate services. These are just the major uh, services that are provided by the uh, social service workers uh, working on the uh, family-focused HIV prevention, care and treatment. So I shared just what are they are doing currently. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Um, let's see if we can hear from Richard. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. And I am happy that uh, Edshaw and myself are working on similar USA funded uh, projects, but implementing in different contexts. So you realize a lot of what is happening in Ethiopia is also happening in Zimbabwe, but maybe zeroing in on Zimbabwe in terms of the key roles that uh, social service workforce perform um, uh, is really uh, varied um, and uh, the roles are promotive, they are preventive, they are responsive, and also they are statutory in nature and uh, being guided by various pieces of legislation that we have uh, in the country, ranging from the Social Workers Act, the Children's Act, the Public Health Act, and other consequential legislation that we have around uh, social services provision. And what we have also realized that social service workforce play a very central role in addressing the social determinants of health. And these social determinants of health are usually around family and community level factors, that will then affect the health outcomes. And how uh, this all unfolds uh, is through the provision of wraparound services that I have uh, hinted to in terms of the package of services that we offer around making sure that our OVC are living in a healthy, safe, stable environment that promotes their well being. And central to this also is the case management approach and the person-centered approaches that social service workforce employ in terms of providing services. So what we then do in terms of um, contextualizing the intervention and the roles is to also respond to the global UN's 95, 95, 95 targets and say across each goal or 95 targets, what role are our social services workers playing? For example, when we look at the first 95 uh, targets, which is making sure that at least 95% of all people living with HIV know their status. Our social service workforce has been very, very instrumental from a promotive uh, role perspective where they have been uh, participating around demand creation, around community empowerment and awareness and encouraging all our clients 
to then uptake and uh, um, get uh, services. So through deliberate reference to the health facilities, we then ensure that um, we achieve that goal. Then looking um, uh, briefly on the second 95, which uh, looks at at least 95% of all people living with HIV being enrolled on antiretroviral therapy. We then come in with a suite of uh, interventions or mechanism and approaches that ensure a retention of clients into care, retention of clients into antiretroviral therapy. And we do this through uh, what Andrew has been talking about, uh, tracking loss to follow up, tracking defaulters, and also helping our clients with appointment tracking and making sure that they um, they get their, their, their interventions. Then lastly, around the last 95 of making sure that at least 95% of all people on antiretroviral therapy have a suppressed and a sustained uh, viral uh, load we also then employ the comprehensive case management approach. And if it being patient-centered, we are also applying all those wraparound interventions to address the social determinants of making sure that our clients have got a sustained and suppressed viral load. Maybe let me just touch briefly on how we are also working around facilitating linkages and, 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 and services within the, the, the health sectors. So we employ the community volunteer service delivery model, which is based on professionals and social service workers at health facilities to act as point of contact that facilitate the interaction between the clients and the health facility. So these key um, personnel are very important in making sure that our clients access the service that they, that they require. Then lastly, let's look at also around the role of social service in fostering collaboration and inter interdisciplinary approaches to health. And um, to, to, to do that, we have seconded the, the point of contact and we have deliberate joint inter interventions with health facilities. For example, we have set up Viremia clinics that are multidisciplinary teams of clinicians, social service providers, psychiatrists, all addressing challenges, especially of our children who die via our road, so that we achieve that last 95. And uh, the last point on that one is around how we have also been deliberately forming technical working groups for everyone who is operating and, 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 and working with um, uh, clients living with HIV. So then say, let's have a technical discussion where we troubleshoot, where we hold ourselves accountable to the population that we serve, and let's sit as clinical partners, OBC partners, and our lab partners. And that way, we have seen that we can coordinate and make sure that we achieve the goals that are required across the 95, 95, 95 goals. I think for now, uh, I can stop it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, well, Kyung and Coyote, uh, I also wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about the roles and responsibilities of social workers in the countries that you support as well. But given that you both work for associations, um, I also wanted to see if you could talk a little bit about any um, challenges or um, clever initiatives that your uh, social service workers have come up with to address the COVID pandemic. Do you want to go first, uh, Kyung? Thank you. Thank Later. You. Let, me, let me go I first. have to prepare oh. for the answer. OK, sure. All right. Coyote, we'll let you go first. All right. Thank you. Uh, before going to the specific role of medical social worker in Nigeria, I want to go by the definition of the WHO on health. WHO defined health as not merely absence of physical illness, but social well-being, psychological well-being, emotional well-being of a patient. So when patient is not socially uh, okay or emotionally stable, we say that patient is sick. So in their, therefore, medical social workers, social workers in general, have a long role to play in the healthcare of patients around the world in my facility in Nigeria. 
Uh, they work together as a medical, as a team of the medical expert within the health facilities. That shows that they are very, their roles are very, very important. Without the roles of medical social workers in, my, in Nigeria, health cares are not completed. It's not complete, you know, without role. So they play a specific role. The specific role of medical social workers include the following. They provide advocacy services to patients. You know that patient that comes to the hospital, apart from the underlying psychosocial, the medical problem that they bring to the hospital, there are some underlying psychosocial issues that also underpinning their work, their medical conditions. So social workers are the ones that have been trained to look at, critically look at these psychosocial issues in order to help them. They address the issue of patients, you know, financial problem, they help in mobilizing resources to address the need of patients in case of, you know, patients sometimes face the problem of poverty and illness, double barrier of poverty and illness. You know, studies have shown there is a correlation between poverty and illness. And then poverty determines illness. Illness can also make a person to become poor. So they tend to look at this and find a, you know, a solution and find a way of every patient to be able to overcome that. They provide crisis intervention in time of emergency, medical emergency, accident and accident emergency, psychiatric emergency, you know, emergency at the children's unit. They provide crisis intervention in order to help patients. They also as as a mobilizer, they mobilize resources from the, from the community in order to support patient care within the hospital setting. They evaluate and assess, you know, the presenting social factors in patient illness and help them to, mod to modify those presenting social factors in patient illness. Also, medical social, uh, social workers in Nigeria, they also look at, um, they involve in integration, social integration of patient back to the community. You know, a patient that in the hospital, they've lost, lost touch with the community because as a result of illness, they work around the clock to ensure that patient is properly being integrated back into the community. They help patient, they help in, in, in empowerment of patient. Or in, in patient they involve in home visiting, they will go on home visiting to look at, you know, for uh, mobilization of resources, support for patient. You know, they help in issue of adherence, they help in issue of, you know, identification of weaknesses, and strength of patient in, this, in the process of recovery from illness. Because patient possess some weaknesses and strength, which they might not even be able to identify by themselves in the process of recovery. And then social worker help them to identify this and work with the patient and family in order to identify these weaknesses and strengthen. In terms of weaknesses, they tend to strengthen those weaknesses, they, you know, to strengthen them. And you know, in terms of uh, strength, they tend to uh, strengthen them so that patient can recover quickly from the from the from the illnesses that they have they possess. They look at um, they also align the psychosocial implication of patient of, of social implication in patient illness, you know, so that patient and the family can be able to, and then so also to help the other medical team to be able to, you know, uh, to be able to understand the feelings and the social implication of patient of illness. Of a social, a social implication of illness in patient life. All right. They also look at, you know, the patient to overcome a stress, stress, emotional disturbances, psychological disturbances that uh, goes along with their illnesses. And then, you know, sometimes when patients have been abandoned in the hospital, they provided support, financial support, emotional support, care, you know, that patients actually need in order to. Um, to be able to recover from their illnesses. You know, they also engage, you know, a patient, especially those children that have been abandoned, the, you know, vulnerable ones, the vulnerable patient within the, within the hospital, within the society, to actually to place them in a home where they can benefit, they can, they can help them, and they can live a quality, the goal, overall goal of medical social, social workers in, in Nigeria, is to give patients the quality of life, you know, as, as the, uh, the quality of life, you know. And, uh, in, you know, we also involve in the training of social workers, you know, within the hospital setting, because social workers, you know, they, 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 they have facilities as a, a practical setting for all the, the students, social workers, 
in Nigeria. Some of them must have a basic practical experience. So the health, 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 health sector, health facility, provide that platform for every essential workers in Nigeria, especially in the area of health, you know, and even in the generic setting, you know, to come to hospital setting, facility to know, to be able to understand the psychosocial issues in patient illness so that they can be able to um, uh, offer solutions to know what to do and then they can become a better social worker in future. We, well, let me be able to stop there and the role and now go into the challenges that we have faced. You know, a lot of social workers are facing a lot of challenges in this part of the world. You know, number one, the problem of workload. Number one, the broad social changes that are bring a lot of issue of poverty, issue of um, family disruption, you know, family disintegration that also have a greater impact in the mental health and general health of individuals, both children, adults, and the aged within the Nigeria. Social workers have a greater role to play in this, in this aspect, in providing, you know, this, this broad social changes, you know, breaking down the community system. Africans have been known to live, have a community, a communal life, living. But because of the advent of civilization and so many other things, there is broken down. Because before, an injury to one is an injury to all. Everybody have to rally around a family member to provide support. But now, because of civilization, people tend to look at, you know, you know government agency in order to provide so, social support. So this has given a lot of challenges to medical social support in, in, in the view of gender and limited resources to provide adequate social support for these categories of patients. So it's a challenge. Another challenge that we are facing is the issue of legislation in Nigeria. Social work has not been legislated. Our social work bill, we have been on that for a long, for a decade, for over two decades now. The social workers have been fighting hard together with government and the, you know, the legislator, the government, the executive to ensure that we have a legislation. that social work is being regulated in our society. Without, being, without regulation, there is limitation to what, there is limit to what social workers can do and to the extent that we can do in order to advocate and then in order to support our team, our great, our patient who are actually suffering, you know, within the- Thank you. I think I, I Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just want to, I want to make sure that, <laughs> that we have time for um, our final panelists to talk just a little bit about this as well. But thank you so much. That's a lot of great information. Um, could you, could you tell us a little bit about, um, uh, Kion, could you tell us a little bit about okay. your experience as well? Yes. To ensure the rights and welfare of the students, school social workers in Korea wear various hats, which include a, a teacher, I mean, educator, a counselor for the students who are for their families and teachers, a mediator, a connector, an advocate, a resource developer, a researcher, a collaborator, change agent of a school culture, a community organizer, and a school activist activist. Prior to the pandemic, in-school social workers provided uh, direct services and ran many group on-site. During the pandemic, the mode of service uh, had changed. We do more home visits, individual interventions, as opposed to group interventions and case management. We try to check the physical and mental health of the young students, family relationships, and the living condition. And we are experiencing a, a, a proliferation of online communications and online activities too. The networking and cooperation with the various social service workers in the community are also very important. As schools go through the turmoil of repeated closings during the uh, pandemic, social workers cherish the face-to-face -face meeting opportunities when students do come to school, which becomes a springboard to build working alliances. The most important role of a school social worker, I think, is not in giving something, but uh, keep standing by the young student at all times. 
Wonderful, thank you. I um, know that we are running out of time, but I did want to check to see um, if there are any additional short questions that may have come up in the um, in the chat box. Uh, Hugh, are there any things that you would like to, to bring up just before we wrap up? Um, yes, I'll just quickly go over some of the questions that have come up. Uh, hopefully you've been reading the Q&A. Some have been answered already directly, particularly by Paul. So thank you so much for that. Um, just to say, I, I think what I'm going to do is just answer a couple myself because they've been answered in the panelists' responses already. So I'll really just direct you to some things that have been said already. Um, but I think we, we, I may bring in a couple more people. If, if anybody uh, of the panelists sees a question in the Q&A box that you're very keen to answer, either go ahead and write your answer straight away or raise your hand and we'll come to you. Um, so in terms of um, the first question, are uh, social service workforce in schools government or project-based? I would say that um, some of our speakers have referred to them as being project uh, government. So very much in Mongolia, we're hearing about that and some initiatives in Georgia and South Korea too. Um, but there is a, still a challenge in many countries that even if it is incorporated within the government workforce, it might still be just project funded. So it might be that it's only an, an initiative for a short period of time. So we very much encourage it not only being legislated and regulated, but also to be sustainably funded to make sure that if it, you know, there's not just a pilot project with a Ministry of Education, but the Ministry of Education take on board having one uh, social service worker in, in every school uh, on a long term basis. There is a, an interesting question about um, is it a duplication? So, do, what, what about if there's already a counselor? Is, is it now redundant to have a social worker? We're absolutely not trying to make anybody redundant by this process. It might be that the school counselor already pretty much plays the role of the social service worker that we're talking about. Uh, but if the counselor is focused uh, just on maybe in-school interventions, so talking directly with students and providing emotional support, but perhaps the counselor is not trained to work with families and communities and child protection services, then there might be a need to have, as well as the counselor working on emotional and psychological issues, maybe also having um, a social worker either physically in the school or regularly visiting the school to, to get involved when it's a family issue, a community issue, or a, a wider child protection issue. Um, so I'm just, just giving a chance to see if anybody has a hand up. If not, I'll just, just quickly point out a few other things that we have already answered. Um, so, I mean, certainly the question about partnerships, we're strongly emphasizing that there needs to be partnerships. So those of you describing challenges, I think we would just agree with those challenges. There's a need for greater partnership across social welfare and education. Um, in terms of the, the point that Lily raises about the unrecognized conflict between social work profession and health profession, I, I would just say that, yes, it's a huge problem that often um, social workers are not recognized by other professionals. And that um, the, the only answer to the, the challenge that you raise there is that we absolutely need to do that. We need to fight for better recognition of the fact that social workers and other social service workers are qualified professionals. Uh, they, have a professional, um, they have a professional status, they have professional associations, they have standards, and they, ha they meet the same kind of professional standards as other professionals. And so we really want them to work on an equal basis in multidisciplinary teams, and we will continue to advocate for that. Um, so I just briefly on when we were, which is uh, the, the concept of good living. Absolutely, I think that we are supporting that. We're talking about the whole emotional and psychosocial development of the child in a health setting and in a school setting. And I think all the answers and examples we've had so far are very much about holistic development, which I think is very much part of the, the good living concept that, that one of our, our, our questioners refers to. Um, anybody else would like to come in on any of those questions? Um, please just open your mic and go ahead or raise your hand if there's another point that you want to raise about sustainability or integration or, or any of those other issues. Uh, can I quickly mention a 
briefly one uh, yes, comment please. I had um, in relation to school counselors and social work workers in the same setting. Um, uh, there is this notion and idea of multidisciplinary work, and I think that speaks to what uh, Hugh was just saying that if they're if they are performing different functions, they can complement each other. And actually, multidisciplinary work is at the heart of the uh, of the school of, of the school social work as well as well as in other other fields. So that might be also uh, helpful in that case uh, to frame it as a multidisciplinary work because it's really important. And that's what I wanted to add very quickly to that question. Thanks, that's great. Uh, thank you, Tina. Any other panelists have any responses to the points raised in the Q&A? Yeah, sure. Thank you Richard. so much. Um, I, uh, I'll add around um, uh, the acceptability or recognition of the social work profession within other settings. And yes, agreed around um, issues of social workers themselves uh, proving and demonstrating their relevance through production and development of um, uh, evidence-based interventions. But secondly, I think also I would require a, co a deliberate collaboration platform between the social workers and other settings and we have seen that to be working especially in our in our uh, project in, in our country where we are deliberate with our clinical colleagues and our OVC colleagues then we um, form these technical working groups and thematic committees where we then see how best do we improve the health outcomes of all the uh, clients that we are working with working with so that deliberate move will also provide a platform for the recognition of the profession um, among other things thank you Th thank well, you Richard I think we're pretty much at time if anybody has a very brief 10 second comment please go ahead otherwise uh, well, end the show yeah yes yeah uh, well, well, okay. I, I believe um, what do my just shortcomings is just to talk about the um, uh, the issue of coordination among all the social workforce. You know, we we there is a you know because we there must be a coordination before we can be recognized as a professional, before we can be um, we can uh, be 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 accepted accepted in this community as a good professional. There must be a co coordination. I'm particularly concerned about the issue of coordination among us, so that we can that, that we should be able to develop a, an SOP that will help us to uh, for people when we are able to, we are in our practices, so that when whatever we are practices we have find ourselves to practice, whether in the school, whether in the rest setting, whether in the community based social worker, we are going to speak like in, in the one voice, and then government and then a part of the government also should also be involved in issue of providing resources and enabling environment for we for social work to strive within our society. I think we, we should we, we should advocate for that, you know, as a, Thank as, you. a as a global body so that we can so that we can give a better recognition to the practice of Thank social work. Thank you for those concluding remarks. I'm afraid we're out of time. I know that Endershaw's hand has been up, so maybe you'll be able to have a, a chance to capture your comments um, through the email discussion, because this discussion will continue. We're not ending with this webinar. So please, if you have examples to share, please write to our contact at socialserviceworkforce.org um, email address to share examples of effective deployment of social service workers in either of these settings. We will continue to write articles and blobs on, on, this, on this theme. I'm sure that Endershaw's point may well be reflected in a future article. And we'll be interviewing many of you for our future research. So you can right now download the technical brief on social service workforce in schools. You can watch out for the paper which USAID is supporting us to write on the social service workforce in health facilities, which will also be coming out soon. And we will be hopefully be interviewing many of you um, uh, in order for us to develop that paper. And we want to do more work on trying to find out about these settings, which we will put into our annual State of the Social Service Workforce report, which will also be coming out soon. And many of you will have a chance to contribute to that report. 
The final way that you can contribute is by completing the survey, which will pop up immediately that you close the webinar, and then you'll be able to contribute additional views and insights, as well as some feedback on today's webinar. And of course, a rec recording will be available, and on the website, you'll also find all the presentations. We will not be emailing them, but you can find them on our website. So uh, hopefully that covers everything. Um, so I think on behalf of everybody, and I'd like to very much thank um, Maury and, and USAID for helping us co-host this event. I'd like to thank all our panelists and speakers um, and just thank all of you for being such active participants and for sharing all your insights and questions. And just my apologies that we couldn't get to all the questions. There were just so many to answer, but it's been a wonderful event. And once more, we wish you all a very happy World Social Work Day. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone.